is going to walk you through the multiple choice questions for the passage sixth grade by Michelle Wallace. You were asked to read that passage um, in class yesterday and answer the multiple choice questions that follow. So hopefully by the end of this video, not only will you know the right answers, but you'll be able to understand the reasoning behind those answers, why they are what they are. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to scroll down here, watch your eyes, to question one. Now hopefully you followed the strategy that I gave you yesterday um, when I asked you to look at the question, um, look at the information about the author, and then read the questions first. So hopefully that, that helped you a little bit as you were going through and taking this quiz. So let's read the question carefully. Number one, which of the following quotes from the text best supports the overall theme of the story? So the first thing that I think you need to pay attention to is this word theme. Now just a reminder, a theme is a life lesson. So let's go ahead and put this answer, or this question in our own words rather. So what life lesson does the author um, want the reader to learn? And remember, life lessons can't be too specific and they can't be too broad. They have to pretty much cover um, the main points of the story and apply what happened in the story to life as a whole. So let's take a look at our answer choices. And the first thing I would do is see if there are any choices that we can eliminate. Now let's, let's start with, little, with um, answer choice D. As far as I know, I left that school that day in the park but I stayed to the end of the year. I never went back to church. I soon moved away from the Bronx. Now, I would say that we can eliminate this answer choice because it's way too specific. It deals with something that only happens at the end of the passage and not with the general life lesson. Okay, so it's way too specific. Um, let's see if there are any other ones that are too specific. When I look at answer choice C, she was satisfied for the moment she turned her attentions to another student. These last pieces of answer choice C refer to one specific time. So it's much too specific the way that it's stated. Look at answer choice A. My mother went to school the next day. She spoke to Mrs. Werner Hahn about children. She did not ask for love. I didn't understand that. Instead, she asked for dignity and respect, placing doubt on Mrs. Werner Hahn's professional integrity rather than on her supply of compassion. Now, you may be tempted to put this as an answer choice. You have words like dignity, respect, compassion, integrity. Now, those words certainly would be great words to teach a life lesson with, However, this still deals with the one incident towards the end of the passage where the mother went to school that day and spoke to the teacher about everything that had been happening between the teacher and her daughter. So again, that's way too specific to be a theme for the entire story. So let's take a look at answer choice B. My teacher that sixth grade year was different from the rest of the teachers there. She was disgusted and repelled by my sister and me, and she showed it sometimes too. Now, if you'll notice, this not only deals with the teacher's actions, but it also deals with the effects of those actions on not only the narrator, but her sister as well. Um, imagine being a sixth grader and have your teacher be disgusted and repelled and show it in their actions. So that covers not just one incident with Mrs. Werner Hahn, but all of the incidents with Mrs. Werner Hahn. So that's why B is the best choice for the overall theme of the story, dealing with a teacher that treats you differently. Okay, let's go on to number two. According to the context clues in the fourth paragraph, so that's giving you your location, which of the following is the best definition for the word instrument? Now, let's think about the first thing that comes to our mind when we hear that word instrument. Normally, you're thinking of a musical instrument. So, we're going to have to go back to the fourth paragraph and see if indeed she's talking about um, a musical instrument or if she's talking about a device used to amplify sound or make sound louder, a device used to cut 
or dissect, kind of like you had to do in biology, dissecting those frogs, or if it's a device used as an artificial limb, like an arm or a leg. So we're going to have to go back up to the fourth paragraph. Watch your eyes as I scroll way up. And we're going to find that word instrument. And we have to see how it's being used here. So we've got paragraph 1, paragraph 2, paragraph 3, and finally paragraph 4. Now, here is the word instrument. Okay, so that's the one that we're looking at. So we need to back up a couple of sentences to kind of get a sense of why that word's being used. Let's start here. When she was angry, she would pull her nondescript chin as far as possible into her slender, long, by then strawberry neck. Her nostrils would puff with air and stain red, and it was as if her eyes would reach out with a surgical instrument to pick away at whatever it was in you until either the individual had removed himself or herself from her sight or had repressed that irritating element of his or her character to her satisfaction. So this surgical instrument, surgery, that's medicine, now that has nothing to do with playing a musical instrument. So we can definitely eliminate that one. Let's go back to our question. And let's see which one of these most likely would be used by a surgeon. And then you would say C, a device used to cut or dissect. Now in question number three, we're still going to use that quote, right, from paragraph four, so we don't have to scroll back up there. Um, it's the same one in which the word instrument was seen earlier. And we're being asked which figurative language device is being employed here. Now if you'll recall, figurative language are things like imagery, simile, metaphor, personification, onomatopoeia, hyperbole, things like that. So let's look at our answer choices before we read the quote. We're looking to see whether or not we see a simile in this quote. And remember, a simile is going to be a comparison whoops, using like or as. So those two words must be pre one of those two words must be present. A metaphor, if you'll remember, is a co comparison not using like or as. It's a more direct comparison. Personification, let's review that one. It is giving non-human things human characteristics. Now, don't confuse that with living things, okay? Flowers are alive, animals are alive. It must be human characteristics. And then finally, auditory imagery is vivid descriptions of sound. Okay, so this is what we're looking at, one of these four things. Let's read the quote together now. Her nostrils would puff with air and stain red, and it was as if her eyes would reach out with a surgical instrument to pick away at whatever it was in you until either the individual had removed himself or herself from her sight or had repressed that irritating element of his or her character to her satisfaction. So she's one, remember instrument is something that cuts away or dissects. So pick away as if her eyes would reach out. So there's that magic word as. So there's as. Let's see if a comparison is being made here. As if her eyes would reach out with a surgical instrument to pick away at whatever it was in you. So her eyes are being compared to a surgical instrument. So the answer would be A. There is no personification, nothing non-human. I mean, her eyes are a part of her human self, okay? Um, and then you've got an auditory imagery. There's nothing sound. Now, certainly there are some visual images, nostrils flaring out, staining red, um, but nothing sound related. So in metaphor, it's not a direct comparison because of the presence of the word as. So that's why simile is the best answer there. All right, let's move down to question number four. Now question number four deals with this quote in question number three. So remember her 
puffy nose and the eyes reaching out with the surgical instrument. What effect, that's the key word, does the quote in question number three above create on the characterization of Mrs. Wernerheim in the selection? So what is characterization? Let's put this question in our own words, okay? What does that quote say about Mrs. Wernerheim's personality? about her character, about her nature. So that's what you're being asked to do. Now that we understand what we're being asked to do, um, let's read the answer choices. Does that quote make it seem like Mrs. Werner Hahn is intelligent or smart? Precise means exact. Does it make her seem like she's cold and harsh? Does it make her seem like she's ambitious and articulate? Now remember, ambitious was a vocabulary word from a couple of weeks ago. It means very eager and motivated. Articulate simply means well-spoken. It means that um, she speaks very well and is very clear. Or does it make her seem friendly and wise? Now, I don't know about you, but this quote to me, if her nostrils are puffing up, staining red, her eyes are cutting things away from people that she's looking at, that doesn't seem like a very positive image of Mrs. Wernerhahn. So what I would do is let's go ahead and eliminate the positive answers because that can't be correct. So intelligent and precise to me would be a very positive image. So we can automatically eliminate that one. Let's look and see if we see any more positive ones. Oh, what about friendly and wise? Those are definitely positive. If I'm looking at somebody like I'm going to cut them down, then I'm definitely not very friendly. So let's see, we're left with cold and harsh, ambitious and articulate. And remember, when answers have two words like this, both must be correct in order for the answer choice to be correct. So. Ambitious, it's not seeming to, to indicate that she is eager to do something. She's not speaking. Remember, there was no sound related to this quote, so she's not trying to speak clearly. So the best answer is going to be B. It causes Mrs. Werner Hahn to seem cold and harsh. All right, let's go down to number five. How does the author's characterization of herself in paragraph three of the selection differ from her characterization of the other students in paragraph two of the selection. Okay, here's that word characterization again. All right, characterization. Now, if I'm saying that something differs, then I'm making a comparison. So what two things are being compared here? Herself, or the narrator, and other students. So let's Let's take this and put it in our own words, okay? How does the narrator's, or just the narrator, compare to the other students at the school according to paragraphs two to three? So that's what you're being asked to do here. So let's read our answer choices before we go back up to paragraphs two and three. She was more intelligent and sensitive than the other students. She was less concerned about appearances than the other students. She had less money and possessions than the other students. Or she was not as smart as the other students. Okay, so let's scroll back up. Watch your eyes because I'm going to scroll back up to the top. Paragraphs two and three is going to be all the way back on the first page, so turn there with me now. Okay, let's start with paragraph two. Now, this is going to take a little bit longer to explain, so just bear with me and follow along as I mark some things on the passage. In paragraph two, let's see, she's talking about how she was madly jealous of the other students. If someone's madly jealous, and that's key, then if I'm jealous of you, then you have something that I don't have. You have something that I want. So let's see what they have that the narrator doesn't have. There are little brick homes in neat little rows near the school. So they have nice houses with little Dick's, Jane's, and Spots running around everywhere. 
Now, you're awfully young. Now, Miss Gardner might remember this, but you're awfully young. You probably don't remember the Dick and Jane books. That's whenever we were kids, um, we had a lot of series of Dick and Jane books, and it would teach you how to read. And so it's just about this perfect little boy and a perfect little girl and little spots their dog running around. And then you've got housewife mothers who met them after school. So see, these kids didn't have to ride the bus all by themselves. Their mothers met them there. Whoops. Let's see what's happening with my mouse. Here we go. So she's jealous of their homes, of, of their family, of their moms meeting them, of their crisp, immaculate lunch boxes with clean, wax paper lifesavers. I know lifesavers don't seem like a big deal to you, um, but just wait until you read about her lunch. Tom McGann shoes. Now, I know that you guys have different name brands. You know, we didn't have Nikes, and we didn't have um, Sauconies, and we didn't have Keds and things like that. Um, we had Tom McGann. If you wore Tom McGann shoes, then your mom went to the shoe store instead of the thrift store, and you bought fancy shoes. So those were expensive name brands back in the day. Of their clean white blouses with Peter Pan collars. Now, again, today, you don't see too many kids running around with clean white blouses and Peter Pan collars. Um, my children have a couple of, of shirts with Peter Pan collars, but that's the fancy kind that they take pictures in. Fresh cotton dresses in summer and winter alike. And if you know anything about cotton dresses, they have to be very um, carefully um, washed and dried, and they have to be ironed, all right? Their white ankle socks. Their small clear light print on totally unblemished standard line notebook paper. And their plastic covered super large cute loose leaf. Alright, so she's talking about school supplies here. Of their perfect homework in big blue ink. Right? And their little brothers and sisters who are miniature, convenient, silent versions of themselves. So she was basically jealous of everything about them, where they lived, their families, the fact that their mothers stayed home and took care of them, of the fact that they packed, their moms packed their lunch, they had name brand shoes and clothes. They had clean and ample, that's another um, vocabulary word from this week, ample school supplies, perfect homework, all right? So this is where what the other kids had that she was jealous of. Now let's come down here to paragraph three and let's see how she describes herself and I'm going to change the color to green here so you can see the difference. Whoops, not that one. Yep. All right. I lived in a tall apartment building with a monumental elevator. So she doesn't live in a house in neat little rows. She lives in an apartment building. It's a long and lonely bus distance away from the school. Remember how their houses were right next to it? I had the L train, other apartment buildings, Pigeons who frightened you and did their thing on your head. Yes, they're talking about poop. Push open windows and kids I didn't know for company. So remember up here in paragraph two, they had Dick's, Jane's, and Spots all running around. You know, nice families, nice kids running around the neighborhood. She had the company of strangers. My mother was an art teacher at a public school, nowhere near my school, and she used to dine at for a studio, and she and the walls were usually covered with paint. So remember those nice, clean housewife moms that didn't work and that met the kids after school, her mom had to work. Now, let's take a look at their lunch boxes. Immaculate, clean wax paper, lifesavers. I usually forgot to bring my lunch, but when I did, it had been bought from the Puerto Rican delicatessen across the street from my house, and it was always a liverwurst hero with lots of mayonnaise and very little lettuce. No white bread, no unwrinkled cellophane around lifesavers or cucumbers or cupcakes or anything else. So, I don't know if you've ever had liverwurst. Um, I don't know anybody who likes liverwurst. So, this is not, this is going to be a cheap kind of um, meat. It's a little like Spam, but it's made out of liver, chopped liver. Or when my mother made my lunch, which was rare, it was ham and cheese sandwich with the bread missing or the ham missing or the cheese missing and no dessert. You see? So, her lunch was just kind of thrown together or sometimes forgotten. And so she didn't have any kind of milk. Let's skip down here. She was allergic to the milk. Let's see. And she talks about being... Sp oh, here's my shoes. Remember their Tom McGann shoes? 
My shoes were sturdy and lasted forever. No laces, just buckles. My clothes were made by my grandmother, wool dresses in her own style, style but no one, no one had ever seen. Nothing was white, lots of colors, right? Look at all this. Her racers were dirty. She either had no lines or no paper. Not enough loose leaf. Late assignments. No fine blue pink. I, you know how we are about blue or black pink. Yeah. So, she's quite different from the kids. From, I mean, from where, they, where she lived to how she dressed to the lunch that she brought um, to the way that she did her homework. Everything about her was different. So, let's scroll on down and see which answer choice describes how she was different. Did it talk about how smart or sensitive she was? No. Remember, we're talking houses and school supplies and things like that. Um, do you think she was less concerned about appearances than the other students? I mean, it does talk about clothes, so we'll skip that one for now. She had less money and possessions than other students. It did talk about possessions and things that cost money. She was not as smart. Okay, remember, it didn't talk about smarts, so we're left with B and C. Was it that she didn't care about appearance or that she had less money than they did? I mean, certainly, if you go back all the way to paragraph two, if she didn't care, remember what we underlined here? She was madly jealous. If she didn't care about appearances and about material possessions, then she wouldn't have been feeling madly jealous. So that's why we can um, get rid of this answer choice. And that leaves us with, she had less money and possessions than other students. All right. We're almost done. Which of the following language devices can be found primarily in the following quote? And so look, we're looking for language devices. And remember, that can be anything from figurative language to repetition. So remember a metaphor. And we had that up, up a couple of questions ago. It's a, dir a direct comparison without, like, or as. Repetition is a word or phrase used multiple times. A rhetorical question is a question that, ha that have um, understood answers. And onomatopoeia are words that sound like sounds. like pop whiz bang. Now my thoughts reach to the end, to the end of that recess period, to the end of school, to the end of her, to darkness and noise too, and for now to the fence, and thereafter would blend into chairs, walls, whatever would answer my silence with silence. Now nothing's being compared here, but take a look at all this repetition to the end, to the end, to the end, to the end. To the fence, to darkness. Do you see that word two again? So she's shortening it, right? And then you've got into chairs, walls, whatever to answer my silence with silence, right? So there's overwhelming repetition. There is no use of question, not even a question mark. It's not talking about sound, right? So repetition is the best answer for number six. And number seven is going to refer back to this same quote, right? So what effect does the language device found in paragraph seven have upon the story? Remember, we identified this as repetition. So what's been repeated? To the end, to the end, to the end, to the end, the end, the end, the end, the end silence, silence. So is that repetition of the end and silence? Does it paint a vivid picture for the reader of the narrator's deep desire to simply disappear? from the painful situation? Does it establish a conflict between the narrator and Mrs. Werner Hahn? Does it cause the reader to empathize? And empathize just means to feel for her, the daily struggles she experienced at school? Or does it cause the reader to view the playground as a living, breathing character making the selection more dramatic? Well, this is the first one we can get rid of because there's no living, breathing here, right? If anything, it's darkness and end, so that would be death and not life. Now, 
there's not a conflict going on here um, and it's not establishing or beginning the conflict so we're left with does it cause us to feel with her daily struggles or does it paint a vivid picture of her s or desire to simply disappear from the situation I would say because of the words to the end to the end to the end darkness silence she wants it to be over she wants it to be over and that's why this is the best answer. All right. So that's pretty much how you have to um, how you have to answer these questions. And now that we've answered those questions, and it's given you a better indication of what you need there, let's turn now to our prompt. So if you'll take this paper out, all I'm going to do for you because this is your third one that we've done in a row and this is a question a written response to Michelle Wallace's sixth grade think about all the things that you've read and all the things that we talked about in the multiple choice and it's asking you to answer the following questions based upon your knowledge of this excerpt from sixth grade Michelle Wallace uses vivid descriptions of characters in the story sixth grade to convey to the reader her experiences with education. Now folks, I'm telling you that over and over again, please use the prompt in order to write your topic sentence. And there it is right there. And it's asking you to examine her vivid descriptions of characters, her teacher in particular. What do these descriptions reveal about the negative impact education had upon her young life? So not only is it telling you to convey her experiences, you could even insert her negative experiences with education. So you could combine this sentence with this sentence to come up with a topic sentence. So again, what are you being asked to do? Look for descriptions of characters that give a negative experience with school. And then you would write your constructive response on the lines below. So remember, you are to include a topic sentence. I've told you how to get it there. You have to use at least three details from the passage. And then you have to have a concluding sentence. So think to yourself, what were her negative experiences? And for each negative experience, give a quote to prove it. And you have to come up with at least three. All right. Best of luck to you. It's due at the end of class on Friday.